Uh, as I mentioned, we, we take a number of factors into consideration when you're making a decision about which regimens to use for a patient. Uh, and it's important to individualize things according to that particular patient. We have prognostic factors. Uh, and remember, prognostic factors means they might predict time to treatment, for example, time to initial treatment, but they're not predictive. Predictive factors really are factors that influence how patients may respond to a given therapy and therefore may influence what therapy you choose for that patient. So I think even if you don't believe in measuring some of the prognostic factors, chromosome abnormalities that we measure by FISH, for example, or the immunoglobulin mutational status. Even if you don't believe in measuring those in all patients at time of diagnosis, I would uh, advocate obtaining that information when you've decided that a patient needs treatment. Right now, uh, the major issue there, of course, is deletion 17P. Fortunately, maybe five, six percent of patients uh, at presentation. So admittedly, it's, it's not the majority, but it's very important to know that because those patients don't respond to standard chemoimmunotherapy, and, and clearly a drug like abrutinib would be the treatment of choice. Uh, but I think getting that information and initiation of treatment is still quite helpful, uh, especially later in their course if you're having to decide on a, on a second line therapy. Well, as you know from your own practices, you have a lot of treatment choices for younger patients. Fitness, as I mentioned, can influence things. Uh, that may be a patient you're not interested in giving FCR to. And I think that's uh, one of the major reasons why bendamustine and rituximab has become so popular. So uh, perhaps that late 50s year old patient who's got uh, significant comorbidities, you might have chosen bendamustine rituximab. Remember in the, in the German trial of FCR versus BR, we learned that FCR was superior in terms of progression-free survival, but we also learned that BR was better tolerated. There was less of the infections risk associated with it. So I think historically this patient would get bendamustine and rituximab, still a reasonable choice, uh, but of course we also have abrutinib, and that's also a very reasonable choice. And I think as we get more data on the use of abrutinib in this kind of setting, and certainly data from randomized trials, uh, then we'll, we'll learn more about the, the role of abrutinib here. But certainly in my practice, if it was outside of a clinical trial, I wouldn't have any hesitation to, to prescribe abrutinib. You, you have that conversation with the patient, here's the options, here's the pros and cons, and then really uh, make a joint decision. So part of the conversation you have with your patient, of course, is the, the risks and benefits of each of the therapies that you're discussing. So let's use bendamustine and rituximab as an example. Time-limited therapy, uh, twice a week, six months in a row, some risk of uh, myelosuppression, some risk of infection. Uh, that infection might lead to hospitalization in some cases in order to treat an infection. And of course, there's the need to come in for the infusions. Um, most patients respond to some degree, and the expectation would be that that response duration is about three years, maybe three and a half years. That's the data we have with bendamustine and rituximab up front. Remember that patient's still young, so you're gonna be facing another treatment decision uh, in the not too distant future. And then we have abrutinib and we know that these patients respond. Uh, virtually every patient is gonna to respond to the treatment. Uh, primary resistance is, is, is really virtually unheard of, and most patients are not gonna stop the therapy or not be able to, to derive the benefit because of an adverse event, uh, at least with their initiation of treatment. Oral drug, take a pill, you don't have to come in. Uh, potential drawback, for now, it's continuous therapy. Uh, we don't have uh, any recommendations at this point as far as how long somebody needs to take treatment. Uh, so that's a question that patients often ask and, and it's something that we're addressing in ongoing trials.
We've learned a lot more about the biology of hematologic cancers like CLL. And by understanding the mechanisms of what gives uh, these cells an advantage, a proliferative advantage, um, an anti-apoptotic uh, signal that we see in these cells, we've been able to identify signaling pathways and proteins in these pathways that regulate these processes. So one example might be Bruton's tyrosine kinase. That's the target of uh, a brutinib. Uh, and by targeting these pathways, we can sort of reverse those advantages. So it's a completely different way of approaching treatment, very different than, of course, traditional chemotherapy and, and even different than immunotherapy. Uh, so I think that those uh, insights are really changing how we approach treatment in patients with CLL. We also can identify subgroups of patients Everyone uh, is talking about precision medicine these days and tailoring therapy, and we have a little bit of that in, in CLL. Uh, you can look at specific abnormalities in chromosomes by a very simple test, a fish test from the peripheral blood, identify patients who are at higher risk of progression, and in some cases, like with deletion 17P, identify patients who respond differently to different therapies and so it, those are the kinds of insights that we're looking for to help us better choose treatments for our patients. And I think that's sort of where the, the field is, is going. Hopefully, we'll be able to better tailor the choices we have towards specific patient groups.